Hello, welcome to another edition of Livestream Insiders. I'm Peter Stewart and together with Krishna Day, well boy oh boy, we are sweltering in some of the hottest summer weather that we've had across the UK and Ireland in many decades. And you know what, our stories are similarly hot today. We have items about Periscope and about Facebook Live and also a whole stack of case studies that we can refer you to as well. I'm the author of the live streaming handbook and Krishna Day uh, is, the, is, the, is a tech expert, a marketing expert with, uh, I was going to say with years of experience, that was going to come out kind of wrong there Krishna, but you know what I mean. I think we both have lots of experience, don't we, in terms of decades upon decades. But that's what brings our interests together. So if you're new to Livestream Insiders, we are really passionate about helping you think about how you could incorporate live audio, live video into your communications. That might be for marketing, social selling, employee engagement, crisis management, whatever kind of shape or size of your organization, live audio, live video, has a huge benefit and perhaps you've already been starting to experiment with it. We really value you being here in terms of spending your time in our company and we're here every week um, and usually every week other than sometimes over let's say a major hub, uh, public holiday like Christmas we might not be broadcasting if that happens to be on a Sunday but typically our shows cover case studies, tools, technologies, and best practice tips, which we hope will inspire you to then use them in your communications. So we're going to be covering lots of interesting topics today. One of the things that we touched on last time was a whole issue in terms of privacy and safety for young people. And in fact, that's the thread through that we're actually got in terms of a number of platforms have been making some updates. And we're going to be talking about that. And Peter's going to be covering some of that, and I will too. We've also got some interesting case studies. So we know that you love to be inspired by that because people in your organization might be saying, how do we integrate live communication into what we're doing? So by looking at other organizations, may not even be in your own sector, it actually can give you some ideas about what you can look to do and then to implement. So that's what we've got coming up on the show. I'm going to pass it straight back to Peter to get kicked off on that important topic of privacy. But at the same time, we watch your comments, we watch your thoughts. And so we'll be uh, looking, because this is a live show on Facebook Live, we repurpose that show and we publish it as a recorded video and a recorded audio podcast. But if you're here live, we very much welcome you and we welcome your thoughts, comments, and also your case studies, because that's what it's all about in terms of sharing with each other and getting inspired from other people's examples, which then can help us with our communication challenges. Absolutely. So let's kick things off. And it's something that we mentioned briefly last week, but we thought that uh, we dig just a little bit deeper in because I think we only gave it uh, uh, just a couple of seconds last week. So in a little bit more detail about, well, as much as we know, as much as has been published so far about Periscope. Now, of course, Periscope is where Krishna and I met soon after the launch back in March 2015. We we're watching each other's broadcasts and uh, commenting in the same kind of streams with other people. We've got some uh, mutual friends and, uh, and, uh, and acquaintances uh, who we used to watch at those stages. But you know what? Periscope, as well as many of the other live streaming platforms, has always suffered a little bit from aggressive uh, commenters and trolls and haters and misogynists and racists. And you know what? It kind of sounds a little bit a bit like uh, the world in which we live, doesn't it? But of course, the problem is particularly on social media. As we know, people can hide behind different names and different avatars and things like that. So you don't necessarily know who it is that is causing so much trouble. And if it is someone like uh, your good self who has put time and trouble into producing a Facebook Live or a Periscope or whatever other platform you are actually broadcasting on, and maybe you're starting off at the beginning of your career on live streaming, then it's something which is going to be putting you off. And as we've said before, it could be hateful comments or it could just be disruptive comments. And you know what? Some of those can be quite amusing, uh, but also they could throw you and they may make you less inclined to be broadcasting live on another occasion. Uh, I do remember on one occasion, I think it was a Scottish politician that went live on one platform 
and everyone kind of joined in who was watching they joined in the same joke and said that they couldn't actually hear that politician so they all were saying can't hear you can't hear you your microphone's broken even though it wasn't and it got him into a bit of a flummox it has to be said there are other people who disrupt by just putting the same comment in over and over again or try and well just disrupt by saying things like what are you talking about or say that again or start from the beginning just being a little bit awkward I mean, that's one end of the scale well, let's not go to too far what the other end of the scale is, but some of those stories we've talked about in the past, which can lead to people being, frankly, harassed and lead to their own personal, mental or physical instability a little bit further down the line. So Twitter now saying that they are going to aggressively enforce their guidelines. They are going to review and suspend accounts that continually send abusive comments. And that all starts at the end of this coming week, actually on the 10th. So what kind of things have they done before? Well, they've banned bots, they've banned accounts, They've made its expectations and guidelines clearer to account holders and users. They also pull together those kind of flash juries within Periscope where people could be nominated and then kind of get together in a live situation during a broadcast to decide whether or not they would consider a comment to be disruptive or hurtful or indeed hateful and you vote within a live Periscope stream, and if enough people deem that comment to be hurtful or hateful, then that uh, commenter is thrown out. But the problem is that if they are thrown out, if they are blocked, they're only blocked for that single stream. They are not blocked from anywhere else. So of course that means that they can just leave that stream and go on to another stream and disrupt someone else's broadcast and someone else's life, which Twitter has now decided, Twitter of course being the owner of Periscope, has decided frankly that's not good enough. So what's going to happen now is that if someone is thrown out and blocked from one stream, then that's going to be red flagged to the reviewers to take a closer look at those users, uh, people who are continually flagged up for being abusive or disruptive and see how often it's happening, why it's happening, who those people are and whether those accounts need to be well perhaps suspended or blocked from more streams or more often or for a certain period of time. And of course cracking down on these kinds of disruptors is something which uh, is common, common to all sorts of uh, platforms particularly perhaps for Twitter Periscope, because I'm reading at TheVerge.com that monthly user count on Periscope dropped by a million users over the last few months. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because Krishna and I have certainly said in the past, how long can Periscope continue to go on for? Because the branding is still, to my mind, a little bit confused. You need a separate app. There are some advantages. There are many, many advantages, certainly many more that uh, Krishna and I were hearing from at Mojo Fest uh, a couple of months ago, that big uh, uh, conversation and communication uh, meeting which happened in Galway in Ireland a couple of months ago. And some great advocates for Periscope were there, reminding us of some of the fantastic attributes that Periscope has way in above your Facebook Lives or your Twitter Lives or any of the other platforms. But a million people or a million fewer people using that over the last few months has obviously got to be a cause for concern, particularly when Twitter itself has got such a high profile with a certain well-known president using it every couple of hours. So just to finish off this, Periscope say we are committed to making sure everyone feels safe, whether you're broadcasting or just tuning in. Look out for more changes across policies, product and enforcement as we continue to make both Periscope and Twitter safer. Policies, yes, those guidelines. Enforcement, yes, then reviewing people who are continual offenders, but also product as well. That's interesting. Continual changes to policies, 
product and enforcement. Watch this space to see how Periscope could be changing over the next few months. Really very interesting, isn't it, about some things that are now being picked up in terms of online privacy and safety. And in fact, that's the story I'm going to continue with in terms of going from Periscope. I'm going to first take a look at Facebook and what's been going on there this week in terms of something that may have skipped to your attention because perhaps it's not an area that's of uh, particular focus for you. But as a mum of three daughters, then it is something that I'm focused on. And it follows on also from a story from last week, which actually was about live streaming, keeping our kids safe. And what you may not have come across is the fact that Facebook has now introduced a resource for educators to actually support them in terms of the whole area of digital literacy and providing a library. Now, I have to say that this is not Facebook's own content. They're actually um, using resources that have been provided by the youth and media team at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. So in the show notes, so everything that we talk about today, we will actually have a link to that at the end of the show. But in that set of show notes, I've given you a link to the press release from Facebook. And really, it's aimed at educators. And this is where I think there's a missed opportunity, because there are a lot of people I know, particularly in the US and other countries, but particularly the US, who are homeschooled. So parents in that case are educators. And I don't know whether that page is just not available for me because I'm not in the US, but or because of something in my profile that says that, you know, I'm not um, I'm not got the title educator in there, but I can't get to that page, but I can get to other resources. So I've actually put the links to that for you. And I think what I would also recommend, particularly as the with the conversation we had last week on the show was about actually every one of us probably know somebody, if not in our own family, then in our neighborhood, who's actually got young people who are going online and we want to keep them safe and yet get the benefits of being able to use the internet to actually support them for project work. So for example, I've got twin daughters and they're actually on a four week program at the moment, uh, which has been both international and also um, is actually now in the local community. And two of the weeks of the program that they're on, they actually have to support uh, or find a social cause project. And so they're using the Internet to do their primary research so that then when they go back into the program, tomorrow, they actually then will be able to debate with their friends in terms of what's the local community cause, social cause that actually we want to get involved in. And that could be getting involved with something that needs to be done for old people, young people, it doesn't matter, somebody with disability. What are the things that they as a team can leverage in terms of their time and also their connections they're going to actually have over the next two weeks. So it's quite a bit of impact for them, but actually they're doing their primary research on the internet. We know the internet can actually provide a lot of services for good. And so one of the things that we want to make sure is that people stay safe. Our call to action last week was about making sure that I know lots of you who are watching this show are very digitally savvy. And therefore, what can you do to actually help those people around us who perhaps aren't so? And I definitely think that the resources that are available there, particularly in terms of the Berkman Klein Center, are really very helpful because they give us a structure of questions that can be asked or project work that can be done. Um, now, as I said, there's no specific area that Facebook have announced in their press release um, in terms of how to find the details. They said go to Facebook safety. But there, of course, you've got to go by country. The resources that are available currently are only in English. It is going to be translated into multiple other languages going forward. Um, as I said, really comprehensive resources, not so much on the Facebook site, but on that host site in terms of where they're pulling those resources from. But I have to wonder, is this a little bit too late? Because I know also that my daughters have actually also had education and we've had parents evenings that have been talking about this. So great news, Facebook. Just wonder if there's anything else that could be done to really accelerate it. Now, picking up on that same whole area of safety, if you follow me on Twitter or you follow me on Google Plus or various other places, you actually might well have seen me posting about something I saw for the first time this week. 
And again, this is very much something that's welcome from me as a, as a parent, and hopefully you'll agree that this is also welcome as well. But when I went to upload the replay of Livestream Insiders, um, in fact, last Sunday, one of the things that I saw was this notification and it came up. Now, maybe you've had this uh, earlier than I have. So if you've been uploading videos to Facebook or even live streaming on Facebook, have you seen this notification which says, do minors appear in this video? Make sure that you follow our policies around child safety on YouTube and comply with any label or obligations you may have. Now, again, as I said, all the links to the supporting resources around um, you know, YouTube and YouTube safety, their community guidelines and their policy will be in the links afterwards. But that's the first time I've seen it. Is this something that you've noticed? Or maybe it's not rolling out everywhere. Maybe it's rolling out at a different speed in different locations. Now, I actively use my YouTube account every single week, not just for watching, but actually for publishing content. So I was really pleased to see that. And particularly, again, because we've got lots of young people who are creating content. Again, YouTube, are you a bit late in doing this? I mean, how many young vloggers are there out there? There's lots of people who've got, actually I know who are vlogging in terms of with content and their parents are managing the channel. In fact, one of my clients is in that situation where you know the whole show is actually featuring their children, it's not even the parents who are in it. And perhaps you're following big YouTubers, again, where there's young people in it. In that case, the parent is managing that channel. But there are also sort of the situations where perhaps kids are doing it independently. So interested in terms of, of what your thoughts are in terms of those whole areas in terms of privacy. Now, while we stay with YouTube just for a minute, I had to get one quick update, which I think is gonna be really interesting for those of you who are looking to um, live stream in terms of both vertically on YouTube, or for those of you who are actually looking to republish content or even promote content. So for example, maybe Snapchat stories that you've actually been creating or Instagram live streams and you want to repurpose that. I'm a big proponent, as is Peter, of actually getting our content to work harder. And yes, it might be relevant to have unique content in different platforms, but for some of the things we do, we actually perhaps might want to get it to go further. So it might be, for example, you create a little promotion about your forthcoming live stream, or you actually post the replay, or you post a snippet of it. Now, you would have seen this happen in terms of if you've been looking at YouTube, and we talked about this a few weeks ago in terms of, or months ago, I should say, in terms of on mobile, but uh, sorry, on um, yeah, on your, on your mobile uh, platform. But what we've actually got now is that YouTube has actually now adapts for vertical videos. Now, I'm wondering, could this simplify our video creation flow? So if you're creating vertical videos, as I said, some of the live streaming platforms have mentioned, or it could be in terms of other video you're using, I actually create quite a lot of vertical video as tutorials in terms of, for example, how to use things on your mobile phone, and actually then publish it. But I publish it, therefore, in Four, sorry, three different formats. I'll publish a landscape format, which I think is optimized for YouTube. I'll publish a square format for um, Insta Instagram, for example, if it's a short piece of content, and I'll post that square perhaps also onto Twitter, and I'll post a square also onto Facebook, and I might have a vertical piece of content, which is then optimized for Instagram stories or IGTV. It's a lot of work to do that. And I'm wondering, can I simplify some of my processes now? Because what will happen, and if you're looking, therefore, at a piece of content that is not in port sorry, in uh, landscape mode, and it's in portrait or a different format of that, you'll no longer see the black bars around that content. And so they've actually, you know, are recognizing the fact that lots of people are creating content and viewing their content on their mobile device. I watch a lot of content on my phone, but be that TV on demand, or it might be videos that I'm watching or other content. And so no matter what your uh, aspect ratio is of that video, it's actually going to be optimized there in terms of on your computer screen. So yes, they brought it to mobile previously, but what we should be able to find is if you've actually got video like that, and maybe you want to test it yourself, log out of your account, go back to your own account and see if you are actually experiencing it now. No more horrible black bars. And I do think as a 
creator that may well help us in terms of making our workflow a little simpler but of course we've also got to wait for other video hosting platforms to be able to catch up with that as well in terms of being able to optimize no matter what the aspect ratio is of that content but for me that was great news from youtube Absolutely. Thank you, Krishna. Krishna will be back in a few moments' time talking about uh, live audio on a Facebook live stream. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your comments. I'm Peter Stewart with a resource now for all sorts of case studies, uh, the benefits of sponsored Facebook live streams for publishers. It's an article which has been published this week, and there are half a dozen or more, in fact, seven different case studies uh, on, in this uh, particular article. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll just give you a kind of uh, overview. Uh, TVrev.com is uh, the source of this particular article, TVrev.com. And essentially, as I say, it's talking about sponsored Facebook live streams for publishers. Um, and they're saying that uh, for advertisers, uh, partnerships with a publisher to create a Facebook live stream gives several kind of clear advantages that they couldn't have got if they were just running a Facebook Live by uh, by themselves. Uh, and they uh, talk through uh, various uh, key points. Let me just read these through to you quickly. Number one, the brand becomes the star of a highly customed, co-created live content with the cosign of a trusted media brand the audience actually wants to hear from. Number two, thanks to the branded video tag, the sponsoring brand is not only able to reach a desirable niche consumer in an engaging live stream, but also they can use the data from the video and publishing partner to amplify that content to a wider group of people after the live stream has actually finished. And number three, sponsoring brands can get highly specific and detailed publisher audience data around uh, live views and engagement, which they can use later on for their future marketing campaigns on Facebook. And then the article goes on to give another three. So these are, are really interesting. These are really um, quite specific and interesting breakdown of some of the key parts of a strategy when you're marketing through a Facebook Live and you're doing it in conjunction with another group. Uh, sponsored live streams provide additional revenue to the media company while giving them an opportunity to test new creative formats and experimental ideas. Uh, number five of six, on average we see a significant uptick in new followers on a publisher's Facebook page after a live stream meaning sponsored live streams also create audience growth opportunities for the publishers who sell them. And also sponsored live streams do double duty. They can be used as a bargaining chip inside of a rate card to secure larger, more custom cross-platform advertising deals. They can also serve as a lightweight entry level native ad product as a pilot or proof of concept to bring in new advertisers. Uh, and then the article talks about who is doing the best Facebook live streams that are sponsored. Lots of examples featuring, let's have a look down here, Bravo TV, um, Lays, BuzzFeed, a big uh, car company, Subaru, uh, big uh, publisher, news publisher, USA Today, uh, also the big broadcasters, ESPN and CNBC. And for each of these, they actually have a screen grab and then they break down the data into the results of views, comments, shares and likes. What was live, so a couple of lines of what they actually did, and then how the brand was integrated, breaking down, just in a couple of three sentences, about uh, that synergy, how they actually worked together, how they meshed together those two different uh, brands. Well worth looking at. Uh, the link will be in our case notes, in our, sorry, in our show notes in a few moments, in a couple of hours' time, uh, soon after the show. But that's well worth looking at, because very often, if you're pitching to one particular brand or a company or any other kind of group or outfit, sometimes it's difficult for them to imagine what it is you're talking about. But if you can say, look what happened here and look what happened here, we can kind of take the best bits of that and the best bits of that. You know, your company is a bit like that, but the proposal that I'm suggesting, the actual initiative is a bit like this. 
put them together, we may have dynamite. It may be easier for them to see and to understand your concept if you've actually got a case study to refer to with some actual numbers that go alongside it. Details in our show notes a little bit later on tonight. What about live audio? We talk about live video a lot, but we don't talk about live audio too much. Now, you may not realize that Peter actually works for a huge broadcaster and boy oh boy does his region have live audio going out all the time. Now I know that he creates live video and live video streams, which are usually published on their Facebook page, but he's got a huge amount of experience in terms of live audio. My first passion was audio. I used to have a radio show too, and I then went on to podcasting back in 2005. So I love it when we actually have little stories to talk about in terms of live audio. Now you might be using live audio yourself, perhaps you're using a platform that both Peter and I use, which is called Spreaker, which is a, a podcasting platform, but you can also stream live audio. Perhaps you've used Blog Talk Radio, I used to use that in its very, very early days, and there are many other platforms. You might have been also streaming live to Facebook. Now this is no longer currently available on my iPhone, but you could actually, when you go live, you could have the option to go live with audio. It's still available for me on Android, and I did stream with that in terms of from MojoCon. So we were actually just talking about that, or MojoFest as it's now called. Peter was mentioning that earlier on in the show. And so one of the benefits I find with live audio is that you know you can actually have one image and then people can be captured around that live video content. You don't have to worry about the quality of the video. And that also might be you don't want to show somebody in that video, that person doesn't want to be seen in it, but you still want to bring that, have that live connectivity and see those live comments. What happens though, if you're a larger organization, you may not always want to stream just from a mobile phone. And that's where this next story caught my attention. And the story actually comes from an event that happened a little while ago, beginning of this month. Actually, last month, I should say now, we're actually already in August. And that is Wimbledon. You might have actually been following Wimbledon. Um, and the platform that actually helped them do this was a platform called Grabio. And so they actually um, had a live stream that actually went out. In fact, there were several different live streams they did of their radio show. So they took the same content from the Wimbledon radio show that gets broadcast and they took that same content and it published it then onto Facebook. So again, this might be a, an opportunity for some people, let's say, even if you've got you know, a local community radio show. Back, going back to my kids earlier on this week, one of my daughters was caught up in terms of on the uh, local community radio show about this four week program that they're on. Um, and so they actually had seen all the all the young people in in that particular area waiting for the event that was to take place, and they called a couple of them into the radio studio, and that would be perfect. They could actually get far more reach by streaming at the same time. So in this particular case, um, the All England Lawn Tennis Club, actually who hold the championships, um, which is as we call it Wimbledon, um, they actually took the radio channel from Wimbledon and actually then then streamed it live. And it actually, the platform that they're using called Gravio actually will also work not only on Facebook, but it also works on Twitter, Periscope, and YouTube, as well as other platforms as well. And so people were able to listen to a number of different events, um, including the ladies' final um, and a few others. And they actually had 60,000 comments, which was huge for them in terms of um, you know, the amount of engagement that they actually got. And the article goes on that I actually was reading it about in, um, it actually talks about the fact um, that they actually wanted to take their visual radio broadcast um, in terms of to different platforms. And the head of communications and content um, was actually saying that the Wimbledon radio channel performs extremely um, strongly across Wimbledon.com and our official apps. And to be able to extend this audience is fantastic. 500,000 people alone um, were, were listened to one particular um, event, which was one of the semi-finals. Um, and then they said that this allows people to engage with our content, and we cannot believe uh, in terms of how this has you know, kind of been so fantastic for us. Um, and the Grab Your Producer platform allows you also to insert your brother graphics, animations, and visuals. So really interesting that Grabio was able to introduce 
this integration to be able to have live audio. So in fact, um, if you watch, you can go back and watch the live stream um, replay and you'll actually see there's the audiogram kind of wave that goes through the middle of the image. So it's a single image that's, share, that's been shared, but people are able to actually receive that content on any platform as they so choose. You could go to their apps and you could equally now go to Facebook. So it wasn't all of it. And again, they would have to have agreed the rights now. It's their own station, so they wouldn't have any problems, I'm sure, in terms of getting sign off. But uh, you know, obviously you want to just uh, check out what the rights are for any of that content that you've got that you might want to stream. But I do want to, uh, did want to bring it to you because it was great to see a large organization actually experimenting with live audio, not just those of us who are actually doing live audio just from our mobile phone and sharing that to Facebook. As I said, available currently only on Android for most of us. But if you use a platform like Grabio, then you'll be able to stream to lots of places with your live audio. And I think certainly for community radio and local radio, that could give them so much more reach. And maybe you do that as a special show, a special episode, which also could be bringing people back to your main show. It all depends in terms of how your shows are monetized and what your objectives are for your radio station. But really nice to see that example from uh, Wimbledon and you can go check out the replays and see what you think and how could that be used in your organization for your communications. And I'll pass it back to Peter because we're towards the end of the show now and I really appreciate all of you who've joined us here live and those of you who are watching on the replay. But back to you Peter to actually round up the show for us this week. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's new to me. You always learn something on this show. Hopefully you do as well. But I'm learning stuff as well from uh, from Krishna's uh, own insight and looking at the Grabio dot uh, com. That's G-R-A-B-Y-O dot com. And a section there about how to use it, but also monetization as well. So that certainly uh, made me open my eyes a little bit wider when people start talking about a little bit of uh, a little bit of monetization, a little bit of money coming back. Uh, for, for, for using somebody's app. That sounds good. OK, you heard the alarm go off. That was the first time in many, many weeks that we've actually hit that 30 uh, minute kind of self-imposed limit, uh, which we've uh, done there. We try and keep things reasonably tight on a uh, on a Sunday just because uh, we value uh, your, the time that you put in to watching the show. And thank you so much indeed for your comments and thank you for the loan of your eyes and your ears over the last 30 minutes. That has been live stream insiders episode 144. So uh, thank you so much indeed for watching. We'll be back in another seven days to keep you updated with the most recent updates to the apps and the tech and the production and the presentation and all sorts of things to do with the live video space. And also, as Krishna has just identified, the live audio space as well. Have a great week ahead. I'm Peter Stewart. And thanks to my co-host, Krishna Day, as well. We'll speak to you in seven days. Bye bye for now.